The Candid Frame is supported by donations by listeners just like you. Help us to bring you great conversations with great photographers. Support the show today with your monthly contribution through our Patreon effort at patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame or click on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. Thank you. This is Ivadi NX, and this is The Candid Frame. In an era when photographers photograph celebrities, it's not uncommon for some photographers to become celebrities in their own right. Think of Annie Leibovitz or David LaChapelle. These are photographers who are recognized not only amongst photographers, but also the general public. Then there are photographers whose work is pretty ubiquitous, but who nevertheless may or may not be known by the average Joe or Joanne. But many photographers, editors, art buyers, and other creatives know these photographers because they've earned a reputation for excellence and really raising the bar. Frank Ockenfels III is one of those photographers, and his photographs are seen by everybody, especially those of us who enjoy television. His photographs have been used to promote some of the greatest television shows in recent memory, including Mad Men, The Walking Dead, American Horror Story, Louis, and House of Cards. This and his other work have established him as a unique talent in the world of photography. Well, Frank, welcome to The Candid Frame. You've been one of the people I've been wanting to have on the show for a very long time. And uh, I'm really happy that Cynthia was able to, you know, find some, find some time in your schedule to to have us just talk again. So, so welcome. Yeah, so you have a, you have a lot of ground to catch up since. We oh yeah, this. absolutely. <laughs> uh, but people who don't know, I wrote an a- article on Frank for a Digital Photo Pro magazine almost a decade ago, if, if I'm if remembering feels, correctly. That feels long ago, but uh, it feels time goes by so fast. Yeah. But uh, I, I want to go back to your time when you were at the School of Visual Arts in New York. Mm-hmm. And you said some interesting things about your time there because there wasn't like a, a, a campus. It wasn't like it was Columbia or NYU. That's a lot of what you learned was, was as a result of just being on the street. And mm-hmm. uh, it was an interesting time, you know, because there was so much yeah. art that was happening in the street, graffiti artists and a lot of, just yeah, was- a lot of interesting voices. Tell me about about what that time was like and why it was so important to you as in your development as a photographer? Well, I mean, I came from a small town and I'd visit my dad in New York, but it was always very sheltered, you know, visit to New York in the sense he lived in Madison Avenue. And, you know, so my few weeks a year, I'd be in New York. I'd only see kind of the nicer areas, I guess. So suddenly I was in art school in New York and, you know, 23rd street back in the day oh, yeah. between second and third was not what it I just, and it's funny. I just dropped my son off and you know, over the summer we did, he did a three week program at SVA and they have dormitories now. And it was a very different neighborhood than when I was there. But, you know, we, you go out. I mean, if you were, New York was like the grit was there and the, and the, the light, the way the light kind of came around and moved through the buildings and which still has some of that existing, even with more glass now, the way it bounces off of buildings and arcs through the canyons of the buildings is, is pretty you know, unbelievable to kind of, to see how light moves, you know, because most most people live in the sun rises and sun sets, and mm-hmm. you know it might bounce off of you know a car driving by or maybe uh, your house, but to see it move through a large city is 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 pretty spectacular. And depending on the time of year and the quality of the light, and is it cold or is it warm, you know, those are all amazing things to kind of take note of. So, but it was a time when you know Basquiat was painting the streets and Keith Haring and. You know, the Mud Club and CBGBs all existed, and you didn't go past Avenue A um, unless you're going down to buy drugs, which is the only reason you'd head down to the East Village back in those days. And, you know, it was a very different time. So uh, you walked outside, you went to take pictures, you you had to kind of get street smart quick and know when to take the camera, when to put it away, or Mm -hmm. how to basically carry it in your hand so it didn't look like a camera, which was, you know, an ongoing thing, which is interesting. It was. It was an amazing time to be a young kid, being eighteen in New York City. It was. Uh, it was. It was pretty spectacular. And then you were surrounded by the school, which I don't know how it's structured now, but it was very open to trying to kind of go see, go look. You know, don't look at the obvious stuff. You know, 
teacher saying like there was a homeless guy who lived in the corner and um, the first year of school we'd have a morning a Monday morning we'd show and tell we'd show work we shot that week whatever and the teacher would get so upset every year because everyone would shoot this poor guy you know like a drive by <laughs> I mean everyone would go by like a click picture of him sitting on the bench you yeah. know and and then he'd get so upset with him and he'd say like you know that's just what has anyone walked and sat and talked to him? has anyone gone over and engaged him has anyone really it's like anyone can go by and just be a drive by shooter and just kind of shoot stuff but it, you know to understand who the person is and why you're shooting the picture so so he banned anyone photographing him. <laughs> so it's just like, if I see one more picture, you will fail the class. It was kind of like that kind of thing. Wow. It, it was a pretty great time to be in New York. I mean, and now, you know, when you drop your 16-year-old son off in New York, he's very street savvy of L.A. and gets around and moves around in his own circles and goes out late and, and takes pictures all the time. But it was a very surreal Thinking back on myself, what, what I'd be like at, eight, at 16 in New York City, hmm. you know, I mean, because 18 was enough for me to deal with, you know, kind of what I was seeing for the first time and experiencing and, you know, so, yeah, it, it was it was good. It seems that I read that, that your dad um, was the one who suggested that you go to New York because uh, mm -hmm. he was saying, well, if you want to work in the industry, that's where it's all happening. That's where the relationships are going to be built. Uh, yeah. Tell me about the choice to, well, to yeah, go there. Was, it was a conversation that came more from being around my dad and people that were in his industry and kind of meeting art directors. And there was a guy, he was sitting one night and he said, Oh, my son wants to come to New York city for photography or, or go to school for photography. And he said, basically New York is the only place to be. I mean, it's because the people you will go to school with will end up hiring you one day, you know? And that in that statement was for some reason at 18 was like a, a blow in my head going, like, Oh, I get that. That makes sense to me. You know, that, there's that connection point, you know, early networking. I don't know how you want to call that, but, you know, and sure enough, that's exactly what happened was that Jody Peckman sat next to me in class. And Jody Peckman is the now the photo editor of Rolling Stone. Mm -hmm. But back in the day, she was a, uh, you know, she was a young photo editor working with the other photo editors. And they hired me for one of my first jobs. And, uh, and that, by the act of that kind of, it's, it's all the happenstance of doing photography and how, People always say, like, how did you get your job and how do you do this? And, you know, I don't understand, you know, like how you get the good jobs or how you have. And sometimes just by you're standing in the right spot because it's like, you know, before that, I, you know, the, the connection of like just by standing in the right spot and ignorantly, not mm -hmm. even thinking about it. But, you know, assisting E. Baskin at Saturday Night Live and um, she did all the bumper shots. And then when they came to do, she didn't want to do it. Then one of the other assistants became the photographer. And then I became his assistant. And then, and then suddenly he didn't want to do it anymore. And they came to me and said, would you like to be the show photographer for Saturday Night Live? You know, and I did that for six shows. And then out of my own arrogance, thought it was a bullshit job and didn't feel respected and left. You know, which is, I, I have the, the wonderful moniker of being, you know, never quit the job. It was like, <laughs> you know, and I hadn't done anything. I mean, realistically, it was the most amazing first experience because I was shooting, each week I'd shoot a celebrity, mm -hmm. which you don't have access to as a, as, a, as a young photographer. And each week you'd shoot a band and you'd get free tickets for the rehearsal every single week. So I used to hand the free tickets out to photo editors and say, hey, you want to go see Saturday Night Live? And, you know, and, and it was a good thing. And then from there... You know, the Rolling Stone thing happened around the same time. And, and then uh, I went to shoot, you know, Tracy Chapman. And Tracy Chapman was nobody and her album broke and suddenly it was huge and skyrocketed. And the pictures I spent a day taking pictures of her in Boston became a full page feature in the magazine, double page spread. And that was back in the day when Rolling Stone was, was something to really be part of. I mean, mm -hmm. like if you were in Rolling Stone, you were made, made it as a photographer and people wanted to know who you were. And here's this kid who no one knew who the hell he was. And, and all of a sudden, everyone was calling. And then back in the day, it was um, Onyx and Outline were the two photographers, I mean, two agencies that represented photographers. And, and my agent, who I still have, you know, 25 odd years later, um, was there and saw something in the work and said, I, you know, I want to represent you. And got Jim Rorig, who owned Outline, to say, you know, this is the kid I want to start repping photographers through Outline with. So... It was just this whole kind of like yeah. fall into it, fall into it. You know, my life has had a lot of those, you know, stumbling moments where just by the sheer point of ignorance, I got to do something or the sheer point of ignorance, even shooting where I would shoot and it would be like, uh, I, I became known as a photographer that it could do something in five minutes, five, 10 minutes where people would be 
And this is back in the music days mm -hmm. where musicians didn't want to spend a lot of time. So you go do someone's portrait and I, I always had the, the ability to be able to say, well, I didn't have a lot of time. So, you know, this is what I could do. And instead of taking the obvious picture, I just took the weirdest picture I could find. And that became, I, and I have no idea where, I mean, if someone said to me like today, like, go do that, I probably wouldn't be the same person because now I know too much, yeah. you know, it was nicer to be such an, a snot nosed kid and being so reverent and I didn't have, you know, two kids in a house and a wife and car payments. <laughs> <laughs> you know, back then it was like, oh, if it all fails tomorrow, I just got to make sure I can get enough ramen noodles that I can survive the next week, you know. Well, let's let's go back to that you know that short stint in SNL. You you say it was sort of arrogance that led you to to, to quit. Well, wh what's that about? I I just I, I it was we were shooting every single week, and you had to um, I'd done them enough so I knew the whole routine. On Tuesday, you meet up with the the celebrity, and you go and you take pictures. And there was a time frame where everyone did them in the studio, and there were time frames when people would run around the city at night, and it was all done differently every single year. And I got tired because we always had to shoot in the proximity of Rockefeller Center, which is kind of boring. There's nothing up there. So I started doing things like um, I was shooting uh, the Sugar Cubes, which was a band that Bjork was lead singer of before she became Bjork. And, and I remember them saying, you know, we need something odd. And I had very, you know, irreverently basically started wandering the hallways and the upper floors. And I'd heard there was outer decks on the and Rockefeller Center that hadn't been touched in years that no one had cleaned up. So I kind of found a way to crawl through a window and got the band to crawl through. And we found these overgrown gardens on the, on these uh, beautiful kind of like uh, terraces that they hadn't touched in years. So I, you know, I would put the band in there. Or I'd take Keith Richards up in a corner of the building up top, at least to take pictures of him or, you know, just found other areas that weren't so typical of going, here you are in the hallway or here you are standing out in front of Rockefeller Center, which you couldn't really do with a lot of celebrities because it's a major tourist spot. You know, the first, first show was Tom Hanks. And, uh, and Keith Richards, and I, I got them to let me take Tom over to the West Side Highway toward this old diner. And he and I ran around the street, and, and it was around the time of Big. That's mm -hmm. how long ago it was. And, and we ran around the street, and we took pictures, and it was great. And then the, as the weeks went on, it, it got harder and harder for me to argue the point to take someone away from, you know, I mean, I met, like, you know, it was um, Demi Moore just had her child rumor. And so I met her in the hotel room. And, um, and we shot around her hotel room for the day because that's where she wanted to be. And I was like, well, that's at least different than being, you know, at the, at, you know, at NBC, you know, at, at where they do the show. But as it went on, it got harder and harder and more argument. And I, and I got a little probably on my, you know, on my high horse. And I was like, you know, I don't understand. I mean, like, I can't take good pictures and do it this way. And then I had, and I, I won't, I, you know, I had a really weird experience as one of these people who basically showed up and they felt sick the day I was going to shoot. And I said, fine, but I wasn't so sure what, what was going on with them. And um, maybe it was an addiction problem or whatever. But I turned around and I said, uh, okay, well, look, at maybe we can shoot another day. You know, let's just, let's get you better and then we'll do another day. And I went into work and got called in by Lauren Michaels and, and, and with her sitting there. And they started yelling at me saying, you, know, you can't upset, you know, our host. And I go, how did I upset anybody? And they said, well, you know, you can't upset the host when, you know, you, you should have just gone around and take pictures. You made her feel bad about herself. And I was like, I, I, all I said to her was if she was sick, we could do it another day, you know. And, and then the, the line came to me, which was, which is what they said to me was, you have to understand the most, the most unimportant, unimportant thing that happens every single week are your pictures. And I don't know why, but I was like, really? Wow. <laughs> well, then anybody can do it. Why the, why the fuck am I standing here at this point? You know, it's like, I'll just go. I mean, and I kind of thought about it for a week and didn't ask anyone what they thought. And I turned around and walked in and I said, uh, uh, at the Christmas show is my last show and I'm not coming back. And they all looked at me like I had lost my mind. And they were like, well, you're quitting this? And I go, yeah. I said, I, I said, it's the most, I said, I can't be someplace where no one appreciates what I'm trying to do for the show. I'm trying to do my best work. I'm trying to find pictures that make interesting things. And, you know, and, and so I left. Mm. And it was very funny because the people who came after me, and there's a photographer now who's done it for a very long time. Um, you know, she figured out how she needed to do it, and that's great. And, but, you know, every week we'd have to take pictures, and I'd have to run back, and I'd have to print them, and I'd have to bring them back up, and they would put them into this way. They would videotape them so they could put them on air. And, you know, and it was a, it was, it was a, it was a lot of work, but I did it because I loved taking the pictures. But as the pictures got more and more just like someone standing against a white wall, it was boring to yeah. me. There's not, I mean, how many weeks can you do that? 
I just was like, it's not. But when someone says to you, you're, you're the most unimportant thing that happens every single week, I was kind of going like, hmm. it's very disheartening. <laughs> yeah. I was like, you know, I, I guess I could go, oh, I understand. And, and nowadays I go, yeah, I get that. So I'm going to figure out a different answer. Back then it was more like, okay, well, then I don't need to be here then, do I? I can go do something else because this takes up a lot of my time and I could be doing other things instead. And it's, it is arrogant. I mean, it is to, you know, I look at people when they come and take my classes and we talk and, you know, and I talk to young photographers and I go, you know, just understand the first, you can spend the first 10 years of being a photographer and just have every single day, everyone pile on your head and that no one allows you. And I said, and you can take that and you can constantly be pressured by it and be pushed down by it. Or you take what someone's doing, like the editorial nowadays, unless you're shooting for magazines that you're paying for the photo shoot. Most of them are just, they are so structured, they're so terrified of doing anything interesting in editorial photography anymore, that it's, back then it was like, that was when you did the cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Someone paid the bill for you to go photograph somebody. And you didn't care if you made any money beyond it, as long as they paid for the picture. But now it's kind of like, you know, there's all these new rules and like, you know, I think it's Time Inc. who wants to basically now, you know, own the pictures. Like we could make money from resale. And now they feel like, well, we paid for this shoot. You shouldn't make any money after you take these pictures. You know, they don't get the whole thing of how like, you know, well, you don't do that for a network. You don't do that for album covers. And I go, yeah, but they pay you <laughs> a mm. large sum of money than a minimal rate to be an editorial photographer. You know, so there's a give and take there. You're getting my talents and then I can make money on the side reselling it and maybe paying back for some of the things that you didn't want to pay for them. To me, it was like, you know, I, I, I just wanted to take great pictures. I just wanted to every day change and do something different. And it was definitely the starting of me saying, there's not just one kind of picture that I want to take. I want to try. Some of these will be natural light. Some will be with strobe. Maybe I want to use a hot light today. Maybe I'll use like the whole thing is going to be done with this camera or this camera or this camera. I felt that that was not my brain. So that was kind of the start of that. So I guess, yeah. And in, in, in continuing on this line of thought, um, one of the pictures that really was uh, pivotal for you in this respect in terms of, you know, finding your own voice and doing something that really served you was your portrait of Luca Bloom. Um, yeah. T yeah. Tell us about that. You know, and I, it was at the time, you know, it's kind of like now everyone shoots with a uh, Canon or Nikon 24-70 zoom or a Hasselblad with, I mean, it's pretty much the industry standard stuff. And back then it was like everyone shot with, around that time it was like everyone shot with a Hasselblad or an RZ. And the same lenses and the same everything. It was always the same format and everything kind of hit it. And the optics were about the same. And and I kind of went and saw a friend of mine, Jeff Kay, who owned a, a – a, I mean, it was his father was still alive at the time. And, and I looked at Jeff and he just he was like, what? And I was like, I just need something different. I'm just tired of – there's got to be other ways of seeing things. And, and he pulled out a Super D Graflex, which was a handheld 4x5 used – pictured a lot with um, – Margaret Bork White, and it's basically a big single lens reflex 4x5. I started playing with it, and it just didn't make any sense to me, and I tried, and I tried to use it, and I just couldn't find the rhythm to it. And then one day, I just was shooting a portrait of Luca Bloom in my apartment, and I'd throw a couple lights around, and I shot this portrait, and it was the first time it made sense to me of what I was trying to do in life, and what was happening, and what my vision was going to be, and, and how I was going to basically... Um, start my career because everything up to that point really didn't have what that picture had and it was an honesty a directness a the quality everything about it was how i wanted to see and so that kind of started it did the people who i shot it for understand it probably not <laughs> but to me it was like everything it was everything i always wanted to be as a photographer what, what did you see in it i mean besides the difference that the camera itself made yeah. what were you yeah. seeing in the photograph that you had not seen before um, it didn't feel like a process. It just felt like, the, like, uh, like he was looking back to me hmm. and that in the middle of a conversation that he and I were to stop for a moment and he looked at me. And then as I looked back at him, I could see that he was, that there was, you know, that he was present in the moment for me. You know what I mean? I mean, like, it's like looking at paintings sometimes, like you can look at great paintings and you know, the ones where there was a connection between the artist, you know, who painted them and there, and then the other ones who just painted them. You know, I think that sometimes you see that and even in the most abstract way, I mean, you know, you look at, you know, the abstract portraits of Francis Bacon and you look at some of the portraits that are just so smeared and the paint's gone everywhere and you get it immediately that who that person is, you know, just by the energy of the stroke. And, and I think at the same point, you know, when I saw Luca, he was, you know, he was 
kind of a classic Irish, beautiful, character-driven face, you know, and the quality of just taking a little hot light and kind of bouncing it off of a silver card and kind of just abstractly looking at the background and not making it that it's about the background, it's more about looking at the person and, and not making too many things that would basically distract you from seeing the face. I mean, there were all these little elements to it, you know, and, the, and, I, and I still to date, like I'll still shoot with this camera even though I don't have much of the film left. It's, there's something about it when you pull that picture, you look at it and you go, there's something that is, you know, and maybe I studied too many older photographers like, you know, Curtis and, and those person. <laughs> because I looked at it and I was like, that's a picture. That's, that's what a picture is supposed to look like. But, you know, it, and there was a time when everyone was doing, I think everyone was stuck on that whole, like, Annie Leibovitz, you know, Octobank. Um, mm. You know, you needed to be in a moment. Like, you had, to, you had to build this set for someone to be in or present items around them that, was, that were basically, that would pertain to what they did. And I just, I didn't like that kind of picture. It wasn't my kind of picture. I found it to be, you know, I felt like you'd do so much more just by the abstract point of looking at things. Like, I had to shoot Jeff Gordon years ago, and I shot him with that camera, and I shot him through the netting in the car, with that camera where everything just went abstract, but you felt the energy of what he was in. And there was enough little elements of what he had on that you got what it was, but I didn't need to pull back and shoot him against the car. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was, which would be the obvious to me. And the camera allows me that because it, it's such a shallow depth of field. I mean, I mean, you know, from, for years I was, you know, uh, people would say like, you know, you know, when Kino Flows came out, and some people said, if the only person with you, this would be Frank Ockenfels, because it doesn't have a lot of light. It's a very shallow depth of field. And so it's like, who else would use this? Where everyone was shooting at F-16 at 250 because they wanted everything to touch sharp. And I was shooting everything at eighth of a second, wide open, handheld, because I just, that's my brain. Yeah. You know? I read an article with you, and you had a great quote about um, that every job that you get offered is basically an opportunity. Uh, there's a there's a problem that's being presented to you that you have to come up with a solution for. Yeah. And yeah. that that you know it's easy to do something that's not challenging, and it's you know something that virtually anyone can do. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of photographers do. They sort of play it safe. But the yeah. challenge for a photographer is really to 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 push it and to cre create something really unique. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that idea in mind, I'd like you to tell us a story about uh, when you first shot David Bowie. Yeah, because I think <laughs> that really is in line with uh, with that it's, idea. That's heavily, yeah. I mean, because that was back being the snot nosed kid, that kind of going. <laughs> you, know, you finally get to shoot someone like David Bowie, and and, and and you know, and was it in my brain saying to myself, if I shoot him very oddly and it works, he's going to think I'm amazing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Which didn't even cross my mind. It was more the point that. I was the fourth photographer in a day to photograph him. I was the last one, and, and they walked in, and, and, and the, the line to me was, what are you going to do differently than everyone else has done all day long? And, and I kind of smiled, and I said, well, I said, I'm going to paint you with a flashlight. And I said, if you'd all take your shirts off and stand right here, and I'll just look forward. Uh, and then I turned the lights off, and I just started like doing a light painting of them. And... Uh, and David was like, you know, yeah, show me the Polaroid and then I'll tell you if we're going to continue with this thought, you know, and I pulled it and then he was like, you win. He goes, <laughs> you, you have done the most unusual picture that's been done all day. And I knew the other photographers that were shooting, so I had an idea of how they were going to do it. And I was thinking like, if he walks in the door and I have a big wall of light up and he's just going to do it. So I did the hand painting and then I had this, I knew exactly at a certain time of day all this light was coming through a door. It was harsh, and, and I just shot him with those two things, and that was it. And that started where he would, like, the next job was with him was Rolling Stone asked to shoot him. And he said, well, Frank needs to shoot him, you know, and which was, and I'd work for Rolling Stone, so they weren't having an issue with that. They weren't, like, working with a photographer they didn't work with. So I went, and it was a recording studio, and I said, well, what are you thinking? He goes, I have these two things. I want to use these. And I'm like, okay. So we went off in this room, and you know, we shot these kind of ideally classical photographs of him with a microphone and a cigarette and a hat. And it was like all this kind of stuff. And that started, you know, at each time he would say less to me about what he wanted to do. He would just say, here we are. We need to do this for this. And he'd tell me the things in the night. He never, he rarely came with large ideas. He always just came with, what are you working on? What have you been trying? What's different? You know, how can we play this not safe? Mm -hmm. So, you know, 16 shoots later. It was it was an amazing run with him, and he was always very supportive of that. So, but that's that, yeah. Back then, being what's not obvious 
is yeah. always been. I mean, and I think that's a hard thing because, especially now, everyone plays it so safe. Everything is so so safe, and you know, there's few people that uh, that are not worried about playing to Middle America in a magazine. You know, the art magazines like you know you don't get paid to do anything for, but you get to take really you get access to somebody interesting. You take pictures you want to, and then you hand them in. And then, and then you say, these are the pictures. You don't even have to give them too much because they're just happy to have good content. Yeah. And getting a gig that encourages to you to take risk is, is kind of rare, but you've been lucky yeah. enough with your work with FX and AMC with the oh, photographs yeah. you've been doing for, you know, for uh, American Horror Story, for Walking Dead. Uh, mm-hmm. For a lot of those shows, they really have encouraged you to really sort of go balls off, you know, balls off. Yeah. To, to, so, to yeah, it and, and it all started when I, you know, because I was doing all the music for years, and no one really kind of took a chance on a music photographer doing entertainment was like oil and water. It mm-hmm. made no sense. And a woman named Kimberly Rock at the time was at Gray Entertainment, and she was working with ABC, and they were doing Murder in the Heartland, and it was with Tim Roth playing, you know, Charlie Starkweather, and so we went down to Texas, and I'd never do, done an entertainment shoot. I didn't know what even what, what it, like I had no one even asked to say, "What am I supposed to do?" They didn't, you know, we didn't have boards back then. There was nothing. So I just showed up and just took pictures. And, and her argument, I mean, she actually, it's very funny. I learned later that she, they said, if this, this, we don't approve this guy. And if you really think this is the guy and he screws it up, you're fired. I mean, that's like blatant. Now, anyone taking a chance like that is not, just doesn't exist anymore. So, I mean, so now it's, you know, so years later, I again run into a guy named uh, Rick Fry. And Rick Fry was at the WB. There was a couple people, Suzanne Kolb had come over and she was, she had come from, from ABC in, in the gray days and from gray and working with ABC. And she introduced me to Rick. And then Rick for years would be like, we'd be shooting something. And he'd say, is that really it? I mean, isn't there anything else we can do with this? And he'd always push me. And then that as a young photographer would have that kind of thing. And so it was like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and, you know, an angel and all these early shows. They wanted something a little more cinematic and not so typical, like, you know, ABC promotion or the main networks, they wanted to do something more cinematic. And Rick was very a big proponent of that stuff. And, and then from there, it all started with, um, you know, for years, I did other things. They used to do movies of the week. So you'd shoot different things like Stephen King movies and that kind of stuff. So then it rolled into um, a guy named Brad Hochberg, uh, who owns a company called Refinery, kind of aligned me with doing Mad Men with, um, for the second season. Um, and uh, we did, you know, the picture of him standing in Grand Central Station. And, and at that point, you know, I'd done movie posters and I'd done a lot of things like that. But that started the whole era of what now everyone kind of sees movie TV advertising to be, to really push the boundaries of what it was. With doing, like, every year of Mad Men, every year sitting down with, you know, with notes from Matt Weiner and, and the network and saying, what can we do this year that's this era, this time frame? What, are the, what is the photography? And we'd come up with ideas and and structure and, and where they might be and what they might be doing. And we do these extravagant like portraits and, and settings. And then, then there was the key art, like, you know, building an office and flooding it or all these different things, you know, and then meeting with them, they, they liked my work. So they had me do, um, hell on wheels. And then I did breaking bad and I did. And then I kind of walked into the walking dead. They, they supported me. There was, there was a year where I was, probably the luckiest photographer in the world in the TV round because I, all I did was AMC and FX. I did every show for one year that they both had. Wow. Talk about like the weight of the world on your shoulder, but also the same point is, wow, you really understand. And I would change up ideas. And, and Todd, Todd Huynh's over at, at FX and Stephanie Gibbons, they would, they would say, well, what can we do for Russell Brand? We did this for FX. Okay, now you have Sons of Anarchy. Now you have, you know, here's a comedy. I mean, it was just jumping around and what can we do for all these different shows? And, and they were so supportive in doing that. And, and, uh, and luckily that, you know, it was, I took it upon the point of not being arrogant saying, well, this is what I think and this is what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. I, would, I would sit and I would look at what they've been sitting in a conference room going over with everybody saying, this is how we want to promote the show this year. And, that, and they've, sit not, they've been sitting on it for weeks upon weeks. And then I come in and it would be arrogant of of me to walk in and go, well, I don't care what you guys come up with. This is what I'm going to take pictures of. Yeah. It's better for me to take what they have so suddenly decided that that's what it is and take it to the next level for them. Like how far can we push this image in the lighting and the, and the, and the execution of it to really go beyond your, your wildest dreams of how this could be done. And, and I love that. I mean, I think that's kind of fun to do. 
I mean, American Horror for every single year has been that. I've only missed one year of doing the key art, but every year when we sit and do it, this year is this year is going to be the biggest grand example of that because you know we executed like twenty seven key art ideas and they're all over the place. There is no it's it's not structured like years in past where there was an insane asylum or a hotel mm-hmm. or a, this year is a lot. There's a lot more going on, so I was really able to stretch you know the boundaries of. Uh, how I could light things in so many different ways. And that's fun. I don't know about you, but I think that this has been an amazing year for TCF. Even after 10 years and hundreds of conversations, I think that this year has been amazingly consistent in the quality of the guests and the conversations. This has largely been the result of me being able to dedicate more time on the show, including having help from our long-standing editor, Martin Taylor, and the show's new producer, Cynthia Parker. Not having to do everything by myself has not only been freeing, but it's also allowed me to focus more time on finding guests, researching, and preparing for each interview and bringing you a great show. There's a lot more competition out there than there was 10 years ago when I started the show, but I think we bring something to you that's completely unlike anything else that's out there. If you agree and you want more of what we've been providing you, especially over the past several months, consider supporting the work we're doing here at TCF. Through Patreon, you can support the show with regular monthly donations of $2, $5, $10, $25 or more or anything in between. Your donations of any amount are the means by which we are able to improve the show and bring you great conversations from the world's best photographers. Contribute today by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame or click on the link in the show notes or the website at the candid frame.com. Thank you. So give me a, an example of, of – because it's really fascinating to see how much work and how much, you know, leads up to the shoot. Cause, mm-hmm. And especially the whole collaboration with the creators of the show. And, you know, people sign up on the mock-up or whatever whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And then it's time to shoot. As a photographer, as a creative, I think you always want to be open to the unexpected, the serendipity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you, you are also trying to adhere to something that – a lot of people have looked at and have mm-hmm. debated about. Yeah. So how do you sort of, you know, work between those two parameters and still deliver what they want, but something that excites you? Well, I, I think it's the people that hire you. I mean, they have to be open enough to be able to look at you and say, um, the, the best clients are the ones who get to the shoot and are willing to give it all, give it all up and start over again. And, and that's like, um, AMC has done that. Um, I think it was like last, it was two years ago, I was doing a halt and catch fire and they had a very I, a big idea that they came up with about people smashing things. And I said, well, what's the show about? And they go, think of like a punk band. And I go, well, wouldn't it be cool just to put like a couch against that wall and make it look like the backstage of a, of a club and then we just put like a hard strobe over the camera and they kind of, the center hot spot and it kind of falls out and it feels like an old punk shot. Like I walk in and I shot them in there and I'm like, oh, that's a really cool idea. So we spent a couple minutes doing that, and we did their other idea, too. And mm-hmm. That ended up being the key art. And I think with The Walking Dead, the same way. With Mad Men, not so much, because it would be a conversation. Matt had a very definite, in his mind, a vision of what he wanted. But there would still be the point in the middle of all that to say, well, there's a reason of why you would do X, Y, and Z. The reason the light would look this way. You want him standing here. You want the shadows coming forward. Understand what you're, you know, what you're saying by that. Are you willing to have the person more in shadow than have a, no, have no key light on him? I mean, and I and I try to. I don't dumb it down, but I try to be respectful in these conversations because, and I have done it. I have done it where I come across a little arrogant, basically trying to describe their concept and why what they've drawn is not going to work compared to what is doable. Yeah, you know what I mean. I've said I'll be happy to shoot this, but. You're not going to be happy, but I can, and I, and I'm, I can quickly show them in a nutshell going like, this is what, this is what you've drawn. Now, what if we did this, this, and this, and the people who get it are the ones who are, are, are the most creative probably in the industry because they're willing to kind of, um, I mean, they're hiring photographers. The illusion is they're hiring a photographer to illustrate their idea. And if you've picked a, photo- a certain photographer for a project and you haven't just gone like, oh, whoever's available, have him show up. You know what I mean? That's one conversation. Yeah. There's always in mind, there's, 
somebody and like, I want that style. And I've seen things that people have come to me where they say, we want you to shoot this campaign for us and I'm not available. And then I'll see it come out and I can see why they wanted me to do it. And that the poor photographer who had to go shoot it had to try to execute what I do. And, and it, and that must be really difficult because I, I've been lucky enough that people don't, when I was a kid, people would say to me, can you shoot like William Coupon? You know what I mean? Or <laughs> can you, you know, can you do this? But that doesn't really happen anymore to me. And I would, I would feel that must be really awful to be, to in, to in their mind, they had me in mind to do something or, or another photographer in mind. And they brought the photo- other, another photographer and they say, okay, can you execute this? And they have all this swipe and everything from this person's work and saying, can you do this? And any good photographer could figure out how I take pictures. So, I mean, but, what is, but what is that signature thing? I mean, you, you said you look at the pictures and you, and you see what they were going for. And you see this other photographer trying to emulate you. What are they seeing in your photographs that they're trying to emulate? You know, it's the subtlety to light. I think there's a, there's a, a heavy handedness in photography that is like, and that, a lot in camera. The, I, I don't, I mean, it's funny is I'm going to, I'm going to say out loud because I think I've seen most of the ones for American Horror this year is they aren't composited pictures. They're all in camera. I lit them. I mean, if I showed you the real pictures, they haven't barely been retouched. They just put FX on them. I mean, there's a mummy one out right now that I can overlay the picture I shot. And it's, and it's, it's exactly like there's a set and everything. They're not just shot against a, a white seamless and they're going to composite them later. Yeah. People hire me to do things that everything is done in camera. And that's become a big battle cry lately because, you know, it used to be make it organic, <laughs> which I used to love that word. <laughs> and, I, and I stupidly had to use it. It's going to be organic. You know what I mean? And, and whatever that meant, you know, but now it's kind of like they want everything in camera. As much as you can do in camera, the better. But it's a generation of photographers now. There's two kinds of photographers now, which is, it's, which is sad because it's what the industry is pushed to. There's the photographers who rely on everything being, being composited. You know what I mean? Where, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 the art directors will say, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. The light's hitting there. Don't worry about this. We'll just fix it in post. Which is, when anyone tries to say it to me, I always go like, it takes me two seconds to fix it. Let me just do this. And then I usually make it what they want it to be. So, and, and that's just me thinking on my feet quick enough, you know. And then there's the kids who basically, they got, they've all gone out and bought old cameras and shooting film and, and they're shooting things and every, they're all relying on the mistakes. And, and a good photographer, if you love those mistakes and you love what the camera's doing and how it makes those mistakes, those flares, that, that kind of imperfection of thing, learn how to make that happen. Learn how to create that where it's more consistent but still is allowed to, allowed to be flawed. You know what I mean? And, and if you shoot that way, you'll, you'll figure it out. But if you always rely on putting a roll of, of film in a Holga and hoping that it's going to make the mistakes you made the other day, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Is you're going to, you're going to, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to do it. And, you know? and you've said that you love the flaws. Oh, I love the flaws. And I, you can still make a flaw in a perfect picture. You know, it's, it's just, uh, when, when we light, when we do lighting for, uh, movie posters and such. I, I always love it when there's a new assistant on set because, you know, we'll set up backlights and lights will be around and you'll, you'll see the assistant walk over. And there's rare, there's rarity when there's a new assistant on my set. My guys are all pretty much like older guys that I've had for a long time and they've been very, they're all really great photographers in their own right. It's just a hard industry to start out in nowadays. So luckily I have, I have probably some of the best guys in the industry who, who are by my side who are creative, not just technically great, but they're creative. So when we're having conversations about a quality of light or what I want to do, they get it better. The kid will walk over and you'll look over and they're like, oh, those lights are probably going to cause flare. And you'll see flags start going up and creating this box where, and I'm always kind of like, uh, no, wait, we see what happens first. We see like what is being given to us by the angle of the lights. Like, you know, that little bit of flare will break down the black on that side of the face and make it not so like punchy. You know, and that's what I'm going for in this. If I want it punchy, then I'll say put a negative fill in really quick or block the light off on that side, but leave the flare on that side, you know. And, you know, I love that kind of stuff because, and then every building is different, you know, like where you'll be shooting in some space and they want something that feels a certain way. And I'll look around and I'll go, oh, the sil- the se- you know, the, sil- the, the ceiling to the building is silver and they want it to feel like it's outside. So, you know, all of a sudden I'm putting strobes off the ceiling. And then I shoot all that and I kind of see where it lands and how it falls down. And then I start putting my keys in. 
Now the problem is if I had to recreate that picture, I'm screwed because it's like because <laughs> the building was part of my lighting reference. You know what I mean? And I've had to do that. I've had to look and go like, holy shit, how did I do that? Oh, that's right. We have we have this whole ceiling and it was this. So we have to kind of structure things that are in the same. Yeah. We just did the Magnificent Seven is coming out pretty soon, and we did the poster for that. And we were in um, New Mexico. We were in Santa Fe in a soundstage. And we got every actor, and at the last second, Ethan Hawke had to go to, uh, to the Toronto Film Festival because of a movie he was doing, and they suddenly needed him there. So he didn't come to the shoot. And we had these very structured pictures, you know, big ideas. And, and uh, they said, can you do this in a field tomorrow um, out in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> and I was like, and, and, you know, the guy from the studio looked at me, and he goes, can you? And I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? You know, let's just go do it and see what happens. So, you know, we got two massive semis and we built a black box between the two trucks. And, and I stepped it out that, you know, one, the minute we'd shoot one set, it was done. Then I could turn around and I could shoot the next one. And then I could shoot the next one. And it worked out. You wouldn't know the difference between the pictures. There was only one thing we couldn't do, which was we built a room full of bullet holes. They wanted a room full of bullet holes with these shafts of light coming through. Mm-hmm. But that was there was no way we could do it in the field because the smoke wouldn't the smoke would constantly move around, and I couldn't get it dark enough. I mean, it was impossible to get it dark enough. So that was the only one we had to kind of give up on. But I, if I had to, I probably could have figured it out. I could have figured a way to make it dark enough there. But they kind of said, "Man, eh, don't worry about it. It's, you know, we can live with that." Yeah. Well, I want to talk about your journals because I cannot sit down with Frank Alkenfeld and not talk <laughs> about his 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 journals. They they started because of a, a, during a job that you went to Africa. But tell us about the inception of of, of of these journals and how they've just sort of exploded and and it's, and have become as defining uh, a characteristic of who you are as an artist as your as your photographs. Yeah, it's it's, it's it kind of started with my with my mother who would say to me. Um, because, you know, when I was a kid, I was just always my brain and my brain still constantly talks to me a million miles an hour. You know, my, I used to talk in my sleep, which my wife made fun of me for. Um, but since doing journals, I don't talk in my sleep so much anymore. So. <laughs> but the idea was at the end of the day to basically, if you couldn't relax, was to basically write everything down that was in your brain. Mm-hmm. And that combined with me doing so many different kinds of pictures because I couldn't just want to do one picture. I would, So I started keeping these light journals which would basically, I'd take a Polaroid and I would write all the information of how I made the picture, you know, or what, what was the day like, or what was I standing? This light was created by the wall bouncing, you know, the light hitting off this wall and doing this, or I used this strobe or I used this and I would draw the diagrams. And then as the combination of the two started to meet was it became ranting where it was like, if the shoot didn't go well or went well, I started just writing all over the journals. And so they suddenly became less about technical notes and more about this was the shoot, these are the Polaroids, this is the torn piece from the from the from the lab I got back or, you know, the, the tear sheet or or some newspaper piece I found that had the picture they were using it or and I just start incorporating them in and they were much more structured back nowadays, they're much more abstract than they used to be. Much less about my photography, which is kind of funny. Sometimes the photography is used, sometimes it's not. Um, but it's just still just the the kind of, uh, you know, the vomiting of the brain. And I, and I did them for years and I would keep it in my, I would sit on airplanes and I'd sit with my scissors on airplanes and cut up, you know, pieces of photographs and Polaroids and with my inks and I'd draw on my journals and, um, you know, several pilots would walk out and say, you got on the airplane with those scissors? And I'm like, yeah, and they're just kind of like, they're trying to figure out how I got the weapon on the airplane. I'm like, well, it's just a pair of scissors. I don't know. You know, lady with knitting needles is, and isn't causing any problem issues. So it's like, but I would do these journals and I, and I, I, and I kept this book and it started to become this thing where I'd go to a shoot and Art Richards would say, can I look at the journal? Because they knew that I had it in the bag. And they would sit there and they'd, you know, they'd be all stuck together because of the glue and looking through it. And, and I just answered them. And, and people would say, don't you feel like, aren't you weirded out? I'm like, no, why? And they're like, well, you know, you're showing people you're kind of like what you're thinking and that kind of stuff. And I go, well, if they ask to see it, then it's kind of like reading someone's emails. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Don't go read somebody's emails and then be upset by what you've read. You've chosen to go read their emails. So just let it roll over you and kind of go, oh, I have a different picture of who this person is or what they're doing or whatever else. But that's your own thing. So, And it became the point. I just did it. And it was it was, it was, a, it was the selfish point of like a statement that I'd heard from Richard Serra years ago is, is that art is purposely useless. And, and, and in all honesty, it was, it was a combination of my arrogance once again at an older age of saying, 
I do this. I don't care if you like it. I don't care if you love it. It's just I'm doing it because it's something that I need to express. And if you enjoy looking at it, that's great. And if it makes no sense to you, it only makes sense to me, I don't care. It's just because it's, it was something in my brain. And people reacted to it. People liked the process. People liked the grittiness to it. Um, and, and it's been the weirdest. It goes back to like the internet in the sense of that is that I, I did an exhibition last year in Sydney. I had some of the journals on the wall. And at the opening, um, a woman walked over with about six kids in tow. And she said, we've wanted to meet you for a long time. And I'm, I'm like, oh, well, why, why is that? What's, you know, what, you're like, my, she goes, no. She goes, we use your journals as a base in a class in our art school that, that, that these kids all, and I'm like, and I understand, wow. talk about humbling. Talk about a humbling moment in your life where you're in another country and a group of people walk up to you and look at you and say, your journals inspire us to do our journals. Not like my journals. They do their own journals, but the, in, and the energy behind it. And I met a wonderful photographer who does journals there, and, and we talked for a while. And, and it, was, it was really interesting that the journals were more the conversation. It's like the two things people are talking about, journals and David Bowie. <laughs> it's almost like the rest of my career doesn't exist. You know what I mean? Unless you're into, into television stuff, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, you've done – Mad Men and you've done Walking Dead and you've done American Horror Story. I mean, that's a whole different conversation in itself. But it's the two things, you know, and, it, and it's funny because I'm right now working on a Bowie book and it was, I've worked on it over the years and David and I discussed it because he brought it up saying about doing the book. Uh, I did put something together and I talked to a publishing company and then they came back and I didn't really like what they were doing with it. So I kind of just said, forget about it. And, and we had a big disagreement about something. So I said, you know, it's not worth doing. I don't want to do it if it's not what I want to do. And, and then David passed and, and I realized that I'd never really gone through my archives. And I, I saw, so I, I stopped for about a week and I went into my archives and I pulled all these contact sheets and pictures. And, and then I pulled, um, I went through all my boxes of Polaroids that I have and I found all the Polaroids that I ever had that, that were of David. I took some of the stuff and I went to my printer in New York and we made a series of fiber prints, like 2024 fiber prints that, you know, and I hadn't printed in a long time. I worked with my printer and, and he was very excited when I showed up with all these negatives. He's like, oh, this is going to be so much fun. He's, you know, he's this amazing printer he, uh, named David Frawley, and he'd just gotten done doing Heroes exhibition. And I was sitting there in this room full of all these pictures of Hero on the wall. They were basically coming out of the lab with printing. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the middle of it, he stopped, basically do, because I was in town, and I wanted to sit with him for the first round. And we sat you know, in the glow of, of Hero, you know, which was the reason that I bought a suit with the whole Super D Graflex. It's funny because his Super D Graflex portrait, which he sh shot a lot with, of, of, um, of Sean Penn, was one of my first images I looked at. And I was like, that's, that's amazing. You know what I mean? So here I am. It's almost like a full circle moment. I'm sitting in this lab looking at the Wall of Heroes prints. And, and, and we're looking and I'm going like, oh, my God, I forgot about these. You know, and, and we're just making contact sheets and going through and doing this. And it's, it, was, it was exciting. It was exciting to finally you know, look at it in a different way and not just these are the pictures that we're going to pick for this and the rest can go in the archive, which is what David mm -hmm. and I do. And but I found all these notes, like he'd written a lot on the context sheets and like saying, I love this one. I don't like this one. And so I scanned it all and I put it all together. And I worked with a friend of mine who's a designer up in San Francisco who really wanted to be part of it because we were just going to make handmade books just for ourselves, like make three or four of them and just be done with it because I didn't have an urge. And so a couple people come forward now and are maybe interested in doing it. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I would almost rather like maybe in using David's book as a uh, as a kind of as my Trojan horse is to make someone say, "You want to do the David Bowie book? You're going to have to do a book on my on my on 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 what I feel like is the rest of my career, which would be my journals or my." you know, other photographs that I've taken that are, that are, you know, this is why I do this kind of thing. Yeah. So it's, it is a funny, yeah. <laughs> the journals and the Bowie are kind of my, are my, uh, are my legacy, I guess, at this point. It, it must be interesting because I can imagine you, you're so busy and you're always kind of constantly sort of looking forward, but having the opportunity to look back at, at your boy work was not only sort of like revisiting an old friend, mm -hmm. but you were also sort of observing who you were as a photographer over that period? Oh my of gosh! Time. So yeah, what did you what did you learn about yourself as you were taking a look at those pictures over that span of time? It was it was all film, which talk, start there. There was no digital pictures. There were it was all shot on negative, and it was 
it was it was that innocence. It was that. What if I just do this? And what if I just use this camera? What if I just use this one light? Or what happens if I do this? You know, and and I think that's what David liked about me because he'd show up and he said, "What are we doing today?" And I go, "I don't know. I built this weird bulb thing, and I want to basically shoot you through it. And I'm going to do this, and I'm going to put a piece of mylar behind you." Or, "Hey, I've been obsessed by Francis Bacon lately, and I've really tried to do portraits like Francis Bacon." And it started out doing nudes, and then I had done some of my wife, and I showed him. And he was like, "Let's do it." Let you know, totally distort my face, you know, and, and, and that he was acceptance of that, trying something different with that. And, you know, each time, you know, we had done, it was funny, the, the one that was kind of the, one of the funnier ones was uh, he was doing uh, the New York Times men's fashion issue and he was in the cover and, and uh, he insisted I shoot it. Of course, I've not ever shot for the New York Times and uh, for the fashion magazine, especially being a fashion photographer, I'm not a fashion photographer, so, but he wanted me to do it, so. David shows up with a completely, this beautiful plexiglass, like clear mannequin with a horse tail on it and hooves. And that's what he wants to be photographed with, with this beautiful pink suit. And they were just like, we don't even know what to do with this. <laughs> I was like, it's like and, and I'm sitting there and I, they don't care about me. And I go, he's David Bowie. I mean, he's like, you know, he's like, whatever he says, just let him do it. I mean, it's kind of like, it's going to be the coolest thing ever. I mean, you can do any, you can just put anyone on a suit, put them on the cover, but it's right. brought you this amazing thing, you know? And, and in the book, I put like all the pictures I'd done with the horse tail and his way he reacted to it. And then I put at the end, I put all the pictures that they, like the thing starts out with the cover and it's me and my journal. And I wrote all over it. And then it goes into the pictures that I loved and he loved. And then I, at the end was, the, the contact sheets that have been pulled, cut out and put on a piece of paper with the numbers on them and then what they chose is the cover. You know, and, it, and it, to me, it's, each one of those has that story behind it with David. Yeah. I was, um, I had lunch with Dennis Keeley recently and he told uh-huh. me that you came up to an art center to speak to the students there. Yeah. And he, and he said that one of the points you made was about, you were asking the students, why aren't they shooting every day? Yeah. And, and, and it's amazing to hear someone like you who is as busy as he is, is always making the time to shoot for himself. Yeah. Uh, and I know you're big on Instagram. How, why is it so important that you shoot something all the time? I, I think it's like anything. The minute you, you fall back on everything you know if you don't shoot every single day. Or at least look. Let's just say, okay, let's just yeah. say you don't have to take a picture every day. At least you're looking. You know, and I had told years ago I did a half a semester um, at, uh, at Art Center. I, uh, Everard and I, Everard teaches a class there and, and uh, he's one of the teachers and, um, he and I taught a class together and, and I kind of came in just as like the, the punch point, you know what I mean? And, uh, the first thing I said to the class is I think everyone should keep a light journal. And I, and I tell this to every class I teach. It's like, get a day planner. And now it's even easier than when I first presented this because you have your iPhone. You're sitting in a room, you're having a lunch with somebody and you see this light on the person's face and you should stop and go, how's that created? And I kind of equate it to sitting on an airplane and as the plane banks, you watch the light move through the room right? and yeah. how it kind of basically, it creates shadows and light and it comes in and it, this hard orange light comes in and hits the person's face and then hits the other side of the, of the, of the plane and that light bounces back and creates, you know, the fill and how it moves through and You take notes of this stuff and you make these notes every single day. So then when you finally go to take someone's picture and you want to set up a light or something like that, you know, I need a hard light off a piece of white that's going to basically, that's not necessarily hitting them, but spilling. You make these little notes to yourself. And with an iPhone now, it's like, I just, I mean, I I would say a a ton of stuff never makes it to Instagram on mine. Um, My assistants make fun of me. They call me the sheriff because I say you can't post any more than two, three pictures a day. Otherwise, it just gets obsessive and you're just yeah. wasting. If you can't narrow it down and say, this is what I saw today or one or two, then then you shouldn't do it. You know what I mean? But people post their whole portfolios on it, which drives me nuts. And I usually <laughs> stop following them. And I don't follow a lot of photographers that are my that are my contemporaries because I don't feel anyone's really doing anything. I mean, I appreciate their work, but I don't need to look at what they're... I mean, I post some of the stuff that I... Like ads I'll do sometimes or I'll see billboards I do. But in general, I try to shoot everything with my iPhone, whether it be pictures on set or pieces of light I see or places I've seen or just something I've, I've done or I've seen because I just wanted to take a picture of it and then I process it on my iPhone and I post it. By the act of just constantly seeing and doing, it's like every day you must draw. Like if you want to be a painter, 
every day you must sit down and fail at painting. And oh, every man. day you must sit down and fail as being a photographer. I see this light. I want to capture this light. I can't capture this light. And then you learn from why you can't capture that light or what you're not doing right to do it. An iPhone is more than enough of a sketch pad in our lives that we should take pictures every day or a smartphone. Everyone has one. It's like, so, and it's the joke. What's the best camera you can own? The one that's in your hand, you know? So, you know, Apple's made it very easy on us to basically everyone to be a photographer and to see. And, you know, even, and it's amazing when people say, when you see people who aren't photographers actually see light, it just goes like, oh, it's so cool. I mean, then they're going to understand. Then it's going to translate to someone sitting in a movie and seeing a beautifully shot movie. And they're going, oh, I, I totally get this. You know what I mean? And it's the education of, you know, if we can't educate our people to speak and write and do that, maybe we can at least visually um, educate them with their iPhones to kind of make them understand, like, what is a beautiful, what is beautiful composition? What is beautiful light? What is a beautiful setting, a beautiful scene? What are you seeing as the sun goes down or a mo- or a landscape that you might be in part of? And I mean, I think it's, that to me is exciting about Instagram. Yeah. Well, my, well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore on their own. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've just recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? No, there's too many. So, uh, I won't go contemporary because it always gets people in trouble, doesn't it? It's kind of like, <laughs> you can say me. Uh, Erwin Blumenfeld was a photographer uh, back in the late 30s. And if you look at his work, I always use his work and I, I show it to my students every time I teach class because I show them the work and I say, how do you think these pictures are done? And then I look at them and I go, well, these were taken back in, in the late 30s. You know, and this, these aren't like done in post. They aren't, there's nothing done. Everything was done in camera, whether he solarized pictures or the way he would project light or he would do shadows and you'd see reality and then you'd see this kind of thing and you'd try to figure out how these two things went together. He's probably one of the most, um, even though, I'm a huge Irving Penn and David Bailey. I mean, my people who reference that my life when I was trying to basically start out was like, you know, was Bailey and was Penn and Dwayne Michaels and uh, Robert Frank. And if you couldn't put those four people in the same conversation, but every single one of those people, uh, the photographers, have somehow inspired me to go to the next thing. But his body of his work, of Rumenfeld's work, is is unbelievable, thinking of the time when he was doing it and how totally painterly and beautiful and how so far beyond safe mm-hmm. that any of these pictures are that he's done. And um, so I always use him as a reference a lot of times, you know, because it's like the four photographers I always say, if you looked at it, it's like Guy Bourdain and then he, and then there's... Um, I make everyone look back on Matt Mahern, which people, I can't believe how many people don't remember Matt Mahern's work and, and how, and, you know, I mean, a lot of people don't consider him to be a photographer, but he's an illustrator and a director and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, no, he was, he was a great photographer and what he did for how he opened everyone's eyes through what we can do in photography and make it more painterly. And, you know, um, there's a photographer out of Mexico who is a journalist, which I can't, so my mind's gone blank, sorry. Um, you know, uh, and then Hero. Hero was another one. I mean, I'm a big Penn fan, and, and, and I love Abaddon's work, but Hero was somebody who, when you look at his work, he kind of has a lot more depth than just being one idea. Yeah. You know? But I think people accept there's a safety to look at something where there's a consistency to it. You know, and, it, and, and it's easy to say that where you say, like, you know, pick a photographer and name his body of work, like a, like a well-known photographer, and people always do the one that's very repetitious and not look at the more abstract my son had to do a, a, a class project, and they said, mimic a photographer. And he's like, oh, I'm going to do Irving Penn. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, so show me what you're going to do. And he sends me his text, and I'm, I'd am i never seen the picture. I'd oh, never wow. seen it. <laughs> and I was like, this is Irving Penn? And I'm like going, I'm like going through, I'm like archive, I'm like going through like the Google and going, really? And, I, and I, sure enough, I found it. And he found it. And it was a picture that he didn't know Irving Penn was, but he didn't go after the typical, like, you know, all the portrait settings or the corner mm-hmm. or anything. So it was kind of great that he found something that was, that's the great thing of the internet now. You can really research things and, and uh, find things. Um, if I have to say a contemporary photographer, <laughs> <laughs> I'd say uh, Glenn Lutchford is one of my favorites. How do you spell his uh, last name? Um, Glenn is a fashion photographer. He did Prada ads for years and, and a filmmaker. And uh, he, uh, he's just, uh, I just love his, how he sees. He's, he's British. L-U-C-H-F-O-R-D. Okay. 
Yeah, Glenn. And he's, I don't know, I just look at his stuff and I'm always just blown away by it. And he shoots a variety. He can do these massive sets and then he can do these very simple portraits. And even following him on Instagram is, is a joy because he, he, he'll show things that he loves. He doesn't just show his work. It's not the arrogance of saying, look at me. It's more the point is, look what I see. Hmm. Which is more interesting to me. Well, Frank, so. Thank you so well, much. Thank you so uh, much. Yeah, pleasure. Well, you don't disappoint. Asking. Don't disappoint. <laughs> I try not to. Right? <laughs> I've been told I talk too much and maybe say too many things I shouldn't say. But I, I just figure it's you know it's nicer just to be honest in life. To find out more about Frank and his work, visit FWO3. Com. Again, that's FWO3.com. Thanks to everyone who have and continue to support the show. If you haven't already, please take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store. It helps increase our ranking and creates greater awareness of the show. Thanks to Nicky Spin in the UK for his five-star review. You can also support the show by making a regular monthly contribution through Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash the candid frame, or you'll find a link in the show notes and the candid frame website. Thanks to all of you who recently contributed to the show, including Frank Petronio and Donald Hammerman. You guys are wonderful. Thank you so much. To access our complete archive of interviews, download the free Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS, Android, and Windows. Links for each can be found in the show notes and the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is... The Candid Frame.